prayer and for taking us and for taking us to the throne of grace. Um, thank you everyone and welcome. And may I please request that you continue greeting our pastor with our languages and also uplifting him in our hearts um, as he's taking us again, once again, to the throne of grace. And also may we pray in our hearts that our hearts be recipient of this message, this timely message that is coming when everything in the world seems like there's no hope. He is giving, he's here to give us new hope that there is hope in Jesus only if we do his will. Pastor, may you please take us to the throne of grace. This is your time, amen. Amen, thank you so much. Um, my sister, uh, San Bonani, I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, this morning, amen. Um, we are on Friday. I heard it's Spiritual Friday. And uh, this morning we are going to be speaking about uh, spiritual Babylon, spiritual Babylon. And we are in Revelation 14 now, verse 8. And the, the Bible says here, and another angel followed them saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So here, the Bible speaks of the fall of Babylon. And we are going to learn what the Bible exactly means when it says that Babylon has fallen. All right. This statement is actually taken from the Old Testament in relation to, uh, to literal Babylon. All right. To literal Babylon that existed in the Middle East. We know the how the children of Israel went into captivity into Babylon. Um, now, this statement of the fall of Babylon is not now speaking about the literal Babylon, but it is speaking about the spiritual Babylon at the end of time. Now, the question is, who is the spiritual Babylon? And what does the Bible mean when it speaks about all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's what we will seek to answer this morning. And it's very important for us as we answer this question to go to chapter 17. Chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. Excuse me, I realized that I'm running out of battery and I had not put my battery on power. All right, uh, my computer on power, excuse me. <clears throat> the Revelation chapter 17. The Bible speaks here of a woman and the Bible says in verse chapter 17, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven um, bows and talked with me, saying unto me, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, I want you to notice the language <clears throat> that is similar here in chapter 17 to chapter 14. The Bible tells us that this woman has committed fornication with the kings of the earth, all right? And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Again, you see the wine of her fornication. The Bible says uh, she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So we see that this is speaking about the same power. Go with me to verse five. The Bible says, um, and upon her forehead was written, mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now here the Bible is, makes it clear that this Babylon is a, a woman and this woman is actually a harlot and she's not only a harlot, but she is the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. 
And there's something mysterious about this woman. You can see her, but still there are some things that are mysterious about this woman. All right, so this woman here is, 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 is representative because now we're talking about symbolic language. This is what we are looking at. Um, apocalyptic prophecy is usually uh, comprised of symbolic language, which the Bible itself, either in the apocalyptic prophecy itself or in other places in the Bible, um, actually uses. Now, what does the Bible speak about when it's speaking about a harlot um, or a whore? I'm sorry for using this language. It seems strong. Uh, but uh, uh, these are words that are used for a sexually immoral woman. And like I said, it is not a literal woman, all right? It is not a literal woman, but what does this symbol really signify? Now, if you remember, in the Old Testament, God actually used a symbol of a woman to represent his people, all right? Um, in Isaiah, he says, thy maker is thy husband. All right. Um, in the same book of Isaiah, the Bible says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. And then the same prophet says, Zion, you are my people. So here we see that uh, the Bible teaches that a, hollow, uh, sorry, a, a woman represents God's people. But then how does it happen that um, God's people can be called a harlot? All right. We see in the book of Hosea that Hosea is actually told to go and, and marry a woman of the harlots in Israel. And after this call is made and he marries this woman and she bears children and then she leaves Isaiah and goes and prostitutes herself to other men. And then God uses this and then he goes to, to him and tells him, go back again to that woman and marry her and take her to yourself um, as, as, as your wife or take her back as your wife. And in this symbol, God was showing his relationship with the children of Israel and how, what the children of Israel were doing in going into apostasy, in going into idol worship, in going into all these other forms of idolatry and of committing fornication spiritually with the gods of the other nations and uniting themselves with the other nations. So here we see that the symbol of a harlot is actually a symbol of God's people or a church in apostasy. This is what we see in the Old Testament. Now, when you come to the book of, of, of I mean, to the New Testament, you see something similar. When Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, he says, I am jealous over you. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. He says, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you um, unto one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So once again, in presenting the Corinthian church in its purity, after they have taken heed and obeyed um, um, the, the voice of God, speaking through Paul in his letter, uh, in First Corinthians. So Paul now says, I have now uh, actually espoused you to one husband and I've presented you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So the purity of the church is represented as a chaste virgin. In Ephesians chapter five, once again, we see the Bible speaking about the same things as husband loved your wives as Christ also loved the church. I believe it's verse 25 and gave himself for it that he might pur uh, purify it and cleanse it unto himself. And um, so, so the Bible makes it very clear that the symbol of a woman represents the relationship between God and his church. But like we saw in the book of Hosea, and there are many other places in the Old Testament, I'm just making that book because it's well known to us and it resonates quickly with us. So when we see this symbol of a woman, it actually represents a church. But when this symbol is used um, and the woman is called a harlot, we see the symbol of an apostate church, a church that is departed from the ways of God, all right? Now, this is very clear, and um, we, 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 we want to move from here. Now, in the book of Revelation, you have two women. You have the woman of Revelation 12, which is presented as a pure woman who actually 
is an enemy to the dragon. Are we together? The dragon hates this woman. He persecutes this woman. And at the end, he persecutes the remnant of her seed. So this is the pure woman which represents God's people. And then you have in Revelation chapter 17, the other woman, all right, who, who is a, 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 this harlot that makes all nations drunk, that has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. All right, so you have that contrast. So the book of Revelation, especially in apocalyptic books, there's always this contrast between the good powers and the evil powers, the good powers and the evil powers. And this is what we see. So the true church of God in the book of Revelation is represented as the pure woman. And the apostate church of Revelation chapter, or of, of Revelation is seen in chapter 17 being the harlot woman. And now the harlot woman is not alone. She actually has daughters who actually follow her lead, who follow her direction. So he has other churches that have followed her example. Are we together, friends? They have followed her example. Now, there's something that is worth noting uh, in this Revelation chapter 14. And... Um, in Revelation chapter 14, the first angel's message is spoken with a loud voice. The third angel's message is spoken with a loud voice. But the second angel's message is not spoken with a loud voice. And I'm going to share with you the reason why. All right. I'm not, I'm not going to share it right immediately, but I'm going to share it now. When you're looking at this, uh, this apostate woman or this apostate church in Revelation chapter 17, he uh, she has daughters, all right? In chapter 16, you will notice that when the, 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 the sixth angel pours out his vial, you know, there are uh, actually unclean spirits that come out of the dragon and out of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So you will see that the Babylonian power is actually um, um, divided into these three throughout the book of Revelation, especially from chapter 12 to um, around chapter 20 or chapter 19, where it's very clear. All right, so there's this working together of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we know, of course, the dragon is Satan, but the power that, uh, but the dragon represents the powers through which Satan worked. And in this line of prophecy, you see that the Roman Empire is, the pagan Roman Empire is actually the one that the symbol of the dragon starts out by representing in chapter 12. But then, of course, you see that there is a transition to when it transitions from pagan Rome to papal Rome or the Rome of the popes or what became the Holy Roman Empire. All right. But then you see in chapter 13, this is made clear now how this happens. The symbol of the dragon and the first beast are actually separated. So the first beast receives his power, seat, and great authority from the dragon, all right? And then later on, you see in the second beast, who is also called in chapter 19, the false prophet who works miracles before the first beast. So the second beast of Revelation 13 also receives all the power of the first beast. But where did the first beast get his power? He got it from the dragon. And how does the second beast um, later on speak? He speaks as a dragon. All right, so I want to paint this picture clear in your mind. So you have Babylon that is divided into the pagan powers of the world, into the papal Roman Empire. And then you have the false prophet, which is apostate Protestantism, which will give rise once more to the first beast of Revelation 13. And we are starting to see how that is possible, friends. We are starting to see how that is possible because we remember through a man who was coming from the Lutheran church, a bishop called Tony Palmer. We saw Pope Francis calling the, 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 the Protestants back home to Rome. He said that the protest is over. And this man, Tony Palmer, who was a Lutheran, gave evidence as to why the protest is over and that Catholics and Protestants can speak with one voice. And the success of this movement was such that where two, more than 200 evangelicals 
and 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 um and other uh, other types of Protestants, including the Charismatics. Um, it, this happened, of course, at Kenneth Copeland's church. Actually, accepted the message of the Pope for the Protestant churches to go back to Rome, and a meeting was actually um, organized where they went to Rome to meet with the Pope to solidify this reunification of the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant churches, which I will refer to as apostate Protestant churches. Because if you understood the, 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 the principles of Protestantism and some of the principles that were there in the 95 Theses when Martin, when Martin Luther was protesting against the abuses of Rome, you will notice that it, it was not only about the issue of justification by faith, even though justification by faith was central, there was also other issues like sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone, the mere fact of tradition and Sunday worship in the Roman Catholic Church is evidence that they do not respect sola scriptura, but they go not only by the Bible, but also by the traditions of the church. All right, and they are very clear in that. Now, why is this very important? I'm sharing this because these developments are very important because right now, even on the 500th year anniversary, of the nailing of the, of the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg Church in 2017, the Pope was actually the keynote speaker. Imagine a Pope in a Protestant celebration of the nailing of the 95 Theses to show that the protest is over. They made him one of the keynote speakers in that event. And there's been events where the, 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 the leaders of, of, of the Lutheran church. The leaders of many of these Protestant churches have embraced the Pope and actually said that this man is with us. This man is one of us and we are ready to reunite with the Roman Catholic church. Now, by the way, friends, I'm not bashing Roman Catholics here. We're talking about systems are we together. We're, not, we're talking about systems and we, we would learn if we go to Revelation chapter 18 that many of God's people are actually in these systems that the Bible calls Babylon. But there's a reason because the doctrines that are promoted here, because the Bible says she has made all nations drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the wine, of course, wine in the Bible represents doctrine from a spiritual standpoint. We don't have time to go through this in detail, but wine in the Bible represents doctrine. All right, when Jesus, uh, then the Pharisees could not receive the teachings of Jesus. Jesus said that you cannot put new wine into old skins, are we together? We see the symbol used also, especially by Isaiah in the Old Testament. But when wine is fermented, it speaks of false doctrines that are meant to lead people astray. Are we together, friends? These false doctrines are to lead people astray and away from God. Now it says the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, why is there wrath? Because when, the, when, when, when Catholicism was forwarding its doctrines, and, and it's called the wine of wrath because those who would not accept the doctrines of Rome would go through persecution. They would go through things like the Inquisition. Um, they would actually be killed and burned at the stake like the likes of John Hus and uh, Jerome. Are we together, friends? They would be persecuted and maligned and sidelined like the likes of John Wycliffe, friends, and the likes of um, Martin Luther. Are we together? There are many martyrs, many of the wildernesses who were hunted like wild beasts because they would not bow down and receive the doctrines of Rome as the doctrines of God. So this is why it's called the wine of the wrath. Why fornication? Fornication, actually, if the, if the husband of the church is Christ, whenever the church unites with another power to gain influence and power and prestige, that is called fornication. And this the church did when she united herself with the kings of the earth so that she could use the political powers of the earth to forward her doctrines and dogmas. And friends, we, we saw that in the Middle Ages when through Constantine began the giving of the power of the Roman Empire to the popes. 
And by the time you came to, the, to, to Emperor Justinian in the sixth century, the Roman Catholic Church got full ecclesiastical and political power so that it could persecute and prosecute those who were refusing to follow its doctrines. Are we together, friends? This is historical fact. And we, we are seeing a resuscitation of that. We are seeing once again that this power that is called Babylon is regaining power and strength day by day. Now, let me ask you a question. When it comes to questions of global warming and, 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 and issues of how to deal with the issue of climate change, who does the world now look to? It looks to the Pope, friends. It looks to the Pope. I don't know if you remember in 2015, when the Pope actually released an encyclical called Laudato Si, when he was actually pushing the world towards Sunday as a day that can be used as a day of rest to reduce carbon emissions so that the world can gain a rest and so that we can reduce global warming. He promotes Sunday as the day that can be used for that purpose. And he says that this should be made a day that is mandatory rest for everyone so that everyone can get this benefit. It's not only him who has been saying that, friends, it's even Jews that have been speaking this language. It's even Muslims. Now you are starting to see the response of other religions, including the Muslims now in, in, in countries in the Middle East, countries that are starting to take this and put it into practice, friends. When COVID-19 came, a lot of countries now have started to actually implement green Sundays, that's what they call it. And if you've been following the movements of the European Sunday Alliance, you'll notice that this has been happening in Europe for years, friends, they've been trying to push European, European wide Sunday laws. By the way, there are already economical and civil Sunday laws, which of course is not the mark of the beast yet, but is leading to that mark of the beast. They have already happened in Norway. They have already happened in Germany. They've already happened in Austria. They've already happened in Poland. Partly they have happened in France, in many European nations, but the European Sunday Alliance wants the entire European Union to follow these laws. And they've done studies after studies to prove the truth of these statements. Now they are led by the Jesuits who are Catholic in the European Union. But there is another push in the Western part, in, 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 in the Western hemisphere, especially when you're looking at Canada, the United States. But this push is not from the Protestants, I'm mean, from the Catholics, it is from the Protestants, friends. And what Ellen White says, said in great controversy that apostate Protestantism in the new world and Catholicism in the old world will follow the same policy in actually forcing the whole world to follow it, their own doctrines and dogmas. And this is how apostate Protestantism will lead the whole world because we know that when America sneezes, the whole world catches a cold. So we know that these Sunday laws, especially when it comes to the restrictive Sunday laws, where we are restricted from keeping the Sabbath and we are forced to keep Sunday holy, we know that that will begin in the United States of America and will go through the whole world. But there is a preparation process to that, to where we get to that point. So the Bible tells us that we should be warning people that Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of the fornication. Now, the new movement that began last year that I believe might also be part of facilitating this process, especially the economic part of Sunday laws, we are going to see this. It is happening in the World Economic Forum where they are calling for a great reset of the world's economies. And by the way, if you listen to that and you read it in details, if I had time, I would show you that. But there is a, 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 a conversation that I had with one individual on the web, in, in, on Facebook, where we were talking about this to show that the ideas of the Great Reset are actually straight from Pope Francis. They're not coming from these people, they're coming from Pope, Pope Francis. Are we together? And, and, and so we see that we're going to the Pope for ideas on how to fight climate change. We're going to the Pope on how to actually reset the 
economies of the world so that they are more responsive to things like pandemics and all of those things. We are going to the Pope for everything. And what is the papacy going to do? Once it, it regains fully that power and that trust in the world, it is going to unleash its plan, which is to bring the whole world back to Rome. And this is what we see in the book of Revelation chapter 17. We don't have time to go through that, but this is what we see where the kings of the earth actually gave, give their power to the beast. And through that power, the beast makes war with Christ through the person of his people. May God help us. Because we have not followed cunningly devised fables. God is showing us that what he has told us all these years is beginning to come to pass. And when these things begin to come to pass, friends, it is not time to fear. It is time for us to look up for our redemption through at night. May God bless us and may God keep us. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we are living in momentous times. And we ask that you may awaken us to what is happening right before our eyes. And may we know what Israel ought to do as the children of Issachar did. We're coming towards the close of this series and we ask that your Holy Spirit may continue to lead and guide us and that these messages may spread like the leaves of autumn. We thank you, Lord, that you are hearing this prayer for we've prayed in the name of Jesus, amen.